most images of Africa arrive from sources that are interested in making you feel bad about Africa. Um, and I say this not to discount the incredibly important humanitarian work that can be done in situations of crisis. Um, but, you know, I remember Sally Struthers on my TV, maybe this will date me, sort of growing up, you know, asking for help um, on behalf of, you know, some, some poor kids who were usually voiceless, who, you know, were hungry, no doubt. Um, but that occupies a lot of mind share. Um, in more recent times, we've seen... Um, sort of clever marketing on, in the form of the red credit card campaign or the red campaign for, I had a red iPod at some point, you know, in the early aughts, um, or Tom's Shoes that I think use the existence of poverty and real want as a kind of brand differentiator, right? And that, you know, why are you buying the shoes? Well, because we give one away. Um, and so in those situations, I find Western convenience, matters almost as much as the intended recipients, right? You're donating something that uh, you've got lying around. You're sending your T-shirts. You're sending old clothes. Um, and in many of these cases, uh, the literature suggests that you're depressing a local economy for textiles. Um, Mali is always the example I use. You know, it's one of the biggest cotton producers in the world, but it no longer makes T-shirts, um, in part because of the flood of donated items that come from countries like the United States and uh, put workers out of, out of jobs. So... You know, there are credible, efficient, and uh, effective NGOs, but I think for the most part, you know, many depend on the existence of poverty to justify their, uh, to perpetuate their existence. And I think there's a big problem with that. Um, what's more, I think at the sort of institutional level, the big decision making around development, um, can often fall prey to this logic as well. Um, and I'll tell you a story about the, the uh, instance, the incident that kicked off this book project was I was covering the United Nations Development Week. I was covering the 10th anniversary of the Millennium Development Goals, and the UN sponsored a poster competition um, for this occasion. And the poster, which was clever graphic design, had uh, the leaders of the G8 from the waist up, and from the waist down, they had sort of, you know, skinny kids without shoes waiting in a refugee camp somewhere. And the tagline, which broke my heart, said, Dear world leaders, we are still waiting. Um, and that really, for me, crystallizes this uh, posture, this, this attitude about poverty porn where, you know, people, in my experience, wait for no one. Um, I remember my first trip to Nigeria when I was 12 years old um, and being astonished at how much commercial activity took place in traffic. I mean, I know that it's a, kind of, it's a parking lot out there on Venice, but um, that really doesn't hold a candle to Lagos, Nigeria, which has a population of 17 million people um, in, you know, in a sort of lagoon. And the things you can buy in traffic, I remember with my, my face sort of pressed against the glass, you can buy fruit, you can buy, um, you can buy mobile phone airtime, you can buy uh, belts, you can buy shoes, you can buy live animals, you can buy like luggage, um, and this will date me. The first thing I ever bought in traffic in Africa was um, like a manual VHS rewinding thing, like you could rewind a VHS tape. Um, of course, today that would be like a Nollywood DVD, um, but the point holds that, you know, far from seeing congested roads um, as an opportunity, you know, to sort of feel self-pity, um, people seize upon these as a market opportunities. Um, and, and that's just one of countless examples of folks refusing to wait, um, certainly, you know, taking their, taking their wares to people who do have to wait.